recording. Stop it. Stop We're recording. It. We are recording. <laughs> okay. Stop that. I got we it. We are recording. Are we recording? Yes. 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 Okay. <laughs> All right. First off, welcome everyone to the Visual Effects Society Bay Area presentation of the Power of Story. Uh, we are very happy to have two amazing people here this evening. Um, and I believe that we're going to have a third possibly join us, but we're not sure. Uh, but first up, uh, we are very happy to have Lisa Cook with us, who has spent several decades in the entertainment industry as an animation uh, and VFX industry producer, story consultant, screenwriter, and actor. Hello, Lisa Cook. Woohoo. Hi there. Hi. And then our next person is Corey Rosen. Uh, Corey Rosen is a veteran of uh, is a veteran visual effects artist, writer, and storyteller. His first book on storytelling, Your Story Well Told, comes out March 30th and can be found at CoreyRosen.com. Hello, Corey. Hello, David. Hello. Hello. Hey, Serious, some seriously talented and multi hyphenated people uh, and um i the 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 reason why we're doing this this evening uh is well first off you guys are both you know incredible storytellers but the other thing is that um story as a concept is based is you know the foundation on which the industry is founded and so i thought it would be interesting to have two storytelling experts uh, three. Talk about three, three Mark, storytellers. Mark three. Is yeah. Is uh, did Marcus say he's coming? Yeah, Marcus is coming. Well, we're trying. So, so just for those people who don't know, Marcus Stokes uh, is planning to come, but he is finishing a feature a film. Shoot. Yeah. So he's basically on set shooting like the last day of his his movie, and he was like, "Yeah, I'll just I'll think I'll be done shooting by then, <laughs> so I can join the panel." So. Uh, <laughs> I am strongly hoping that he still makes it, but he almost he cursed him. Good. Yeah, he almost like production cursed himself, right? Yeah, I'll get out early. I'm like, no, 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 don't do that. Mm -hmm. um, but going back to story, I think story is, um, I've had conversations with both of you about story. And it's one of those things that during the pandemic, and we've had time to think about things. Um, I just started thinking about this idea of how intrinsic story is to the very fabric of who we are. And I've had those conversations with both of you. So if you don't mind, if we just jump in, um, Lisa, I just wanted to ask you, because you're extremely passionate about story, how, how did that come about? Um, well, before I got into visual effects and animation, I was an actress uh, or actor, if you want to more, be more politically correct, a female actor. And uh, I worked in film and television. And I became, I, I began to realize if I was gonna play a character, I needed to understand their story because that would help me understand their motivation. So I started looking into story and I just was so fascinated by it that I started to seriously study it. Study the elements, the structure, the history and, and the neuroscience behind story. Uh, and I realized the incredible power of story. A story can, it can start a war, it can end a war, a story can put a child to sleep at night, a story can get a president elected, a story can sell an iPhone. So um, it just has this amazing um, uh, power over us as people. Um, and it's how we all communicate with each other. It's how we, you know, it's how we identify ourselves. So I started, uh, created these workshops called Story Matters, where I teach storytelling to writers, to nonprofit organizations, so they can better help tell their story, to scientists, because I firmly believe that scientific communication is vital now, and scientists sometimes don't communicate the best in story. And uh, so that's it. So I teach to anybody that has a story to tell. Um, we have Marcus. Hey, Marcus. Marcus hey Stokes has joined us. Just pulled in. Yes, yeah, Marcus, you're amazing. We literally just started and you were like barely, barely late. So it's not a big deal. So I'm going to intro you to everyone. Okay. So everyone, this is, this is Marcus Stokes. 
and Marcus Stokes began his artistic career in the field of architecture before moving on to Lucasfilm's ILM. While at ILM, Marcus created groundbreaking visual effects for blockbusters, including Star Wars Episode One, Minority Report, and The Mummy. Hello, Marcus. <laughs> Hello, guys. You, you, your bio is keeping in the multi-hyphenate people that we have going on. Um, yes, yeah. So welcome. Uh, we had just started off on our first question, and what I was about to do was ask Corey, you are now an author. You are a published author, and you wrote a book. How did that come about? Um, great question. Um, I uh, had a funny kind of journey to uh, be, being an author, uh, which is that I've done, uh, you know, since the beginning of my kind of career in life, I've been, you know, doing improv and theater and storytelling and things like that. Um, you know, sort of weaving my, weaving through my career in visual effects has been uh, creating short films, writing, and just performing. Um, and so since about like the late two or late nineties, I joined a group called Bats Improv, which is like an improv theater company in San Francisco that improvises stories and does shows on weekends and things like that. Um, I originally started doing improv because I thought that like um, it would sort of motivate my writing mm -hmm. and sort of like, you know, spawn ideas and things like that because the trouble that I was having as a writer was sort of writer's block of like staring at a blank page and a blinking cursor and having no ideas. But when I like would get on stage, I would start talking and just stuff would come out. And so improv was kind of a, a path into that. And that sort of led to more performances, led to performing with the moth and hosting the moth shows and then teaching classes and storytelling. So it sort of all became that. And so the book itself sort of evolved from all of that, of like taking all of those experiences and putting them into kind of, um, you know, my, my approach to merging all that stuff, like taking improv and like creativity and like, where do ideas come from, generating ideas, structuring them and then performing those stories. And, um, and then there's a the story of like getting, getting a book published, but that's a whole other story. That's all right. Yeah, that'll be, <laughs> you know, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating because, you know, we've all been doing this a while and it's interesting because we've all, all of our talents have continued to evolve. Marcus, you started as a visual effects artist and then have successfully transitioned to a role of successful director. That's, that's not an easy thing to do. Um, how did you, how did you maneuver that transition? How'd that happen? Well, I actually started as an intern at Industrial Light and Magic. I was in graduate school and uh, Lucas offers an internship program and I was fortunate enough to get it. And at the end of the internship, I was fortunate enough to be offered a job, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, the, um, I'm very excited to be talking to the Visual Effects Society because you know, like, um, like most of the people in the VAS, like we spent a lot of time, you know, working on visual effects shots. And, you know, a lot of visual effects artists want to go into directing, right? It's a pretty popular desire. And, um, you know, I mean, for me, it was no easy road. There was a few sort of helping hands along the way. Um, but the story is somewhat interesting. I'll try to keep it brief. Um, long story short, in Industrial Light and Magic, when uh, Corey and I were there, um, you were able to borrow their, borrow their cameras and their lenses if you like signed out all the forms and blah, blah, blah. So I was able to get, get like 35 millimeter lenses. I was able to get to the Panasonic 24P, I think, if memory serves, which is like the first 24P camera at the time when we were shooting Star Wars Episode One. So, you know, I had kind of a line in on getting a little bit of a help, a little bit of help via gear. But um, other than that, it was just a network of friends that I knew that worked at ILM that had gone to film school because I hadn't gone. And then just going out and shooting stuff, right? And making mistakes and learning from, you know, I tended to go out to shoot spec commercials because I was working at primarily an ILM commercial production department. Mm -hmm. so, so the directors that I saw were commercial directors. So then I was like, well, I'll go out and I'll shoot these spec spots and then surely they'll recognize me and they'll <laughs> give me a job and it will be that just that easy, right? So after many, many spec spots and not being able to like get arrested, as we say in LA, yeah. I took the spec spots and I put a website together because we're all pretty bright in that area and somebody thought they were real. Long story short, 
and <laughs> someone called me up and said, we want you to do this GMC car commercial. And so the answer is always yes. Mm -hmm. And next thing I knew, it was like late nights in Oakland trying to get through this car commercial. I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, <laughs> people would ask me questions. I remember somebody was like, do you want any sort of hothead? And at the time I was like, I don't even know what that is. So I'm just going to say yes. <laughs> right? So I was just sort of faking my way through, through all of it. And, you know, it, there were some struggles there and whatnot, but at the end, as a result of that, I was able to, I was able to have the opportunity to join the, the DGA. Yeah. And the answer to that question is always, yes, take my <laughs> money. Let me join the DGA because I figured they could never kick me out. Yeah. Right. As long as I paid my dues, you know, like literally, if you're not working, it's like $50 every six months or whatever. And you can cut me off if I get too long. Yeah. Um, but as long as I paid my dues, they could never kick me out. So that was something I could put on the end of my name that no one could take away from me. So now yeah. I'm Marcus Stokes DGA right? Which gives you a little bit of street cred, street cred, I guess. Yeah. So then I knew I had to move to LA, right? At this point, this was, was, between, was in between Industrial Light and Magic and The Matrix, which was actually in Oakland. Yeah. Um, so I was doing Matrix 2 and 3, and I was like, what's next? And I didn't want to go to LA with no job and just, I want to be a director. So I was able to get a job at Digital Domain down in LA working on iRobot and a Peter Pan remake and Flags of Our Fathers. And so then at least I was in the zone. And I'll never forget, they wanted, my, I think I came in as like a generalist or something, but you know, I'd been a supervisor on Matrix. So when I'd finished iRobot, they were like, we like this guy. We want him to be CG supervisor on this new movie. And the movie was a film called Stealth. And I don't know if you remember the film called Stealth, but it, it starred, um, played Ray, uh, the comedian that played Ray in the, in the uh, what's his name? Jamie Foxx. Oh, yeah. It starred oh, yeah. Jamie Foxx. And I think, um, Jessica Beale, and it was about a plane that is like sentient and they have to hunt the plane down, right? And yeah. I read the script and it was terrible. <laughs> and I remember going back in the office and being like, guys, I, I, you can't put me on this film. The film is horrible. And the other CD supervisor on the project was like, yeah, the script's terrible. It doesn't matter. We're going to do all this cool stuff. And that was the moment I knew. I was like, that's not enough. Yeah. Just doing cool visual effects on a film that we all know is no good is not enough for me. Well, we've all done so that too. Again, <laughs> and again, feel free to cut me off because the story gets a little bit long-winded, <laughs> but that was the moment that I quit, right? Mm -hmm. So I left, uh, digital, I left Digital Domain and I was like, I got to go out and shoot a short uh, to speed the story up. I went out, I had some friends of mine that had gone to AFI and I got too much money together you know, that I saved up from different uh, films. And I made a film that was way too long, a short film. It was like 22 minutes. It was like way too long. It would have been like six, right? But just like everyone else, I didn't listen. Half the people were saying, just make a feature. I didn't listen. If you're making a short, make it five minutes or less. I didn't listen. Yeah. I made a 20 minute short film and I got lucky, right? I sold it to HBO. I got my money back. I got lucky, yeah. right? Because that should have been the path of disaster. Yeah. Right, you know, taking all your, which is a, a common thing. People in film school, they spent tens of thousands of dollars on these short films that really begat nothing, right? Yeah. You do learn from them, but they're not marketable in any way. And anyone that tells you make a feature instead is right, right? Yeah. But you're always nervous because a mm -hmm. feature is so daunting that you're like, I can't handle the feature, but five, 10, 20 minutes, I can handle that. So after the short film, I, I sold to HBO, I got a little heat, that heat dissipated. And then from then it was just refusing to give up, right? Yeah. And I found these directing programs that all the networks have, they're very hard to get into. And I felt like if I just keep winning them, eventually they'll have to let me in. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Okay. So that's I why gonna, on my resume. Yeah. Marcus, I'm going to cut you off because you're about to start answering sure. questions I haven't asked yet. We're pacing. We're pacing. Sorry. Um, I did get long winded. I apologize. Yeah. Ah, dude, okay. we all do. We're, we're all very long winded on this. Um, my, um, I get, so um, uh, the, we're talking about the power of story. And um, one of the things that I'm continuously intrigued by is how, uh, stories are everywhere. And Lisa, I wanted to ask you, um, because of, because of your work with it, why, why are stories so powerful? Oh my God, don't get me started. There's yeah. so many reasons, but basically stories are how we make sense of the world, how we put order into this chaotic life that we live. 
our, our, little, our brains are these pattern seeking instruments. Our brains are always searching for a pattern to make sense of, the, of our lives. And the thing about story is it's a familiar pattern. It, 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 the classic story structure that Aristotle came up with was act one, act two, act three. So that's a, that's a rhythm of three. And that rhythm of three resonates with human beings in a familiar pattern that mirrors the experience of life. We have birth, life, death, past, present, future, uh, morning, noon, night. You have one and two and a three, A, B, C, ready, go, ready set, fire. You don't go one and a two. It does, we need that three. It's a comfortable pattern for our brains um, and, and stories everywhere. It's how we communicate with each other. It's how societies communicate. Um, it's, our most, uh, it's our most primal and one of our most ancient forms of communication. Um, societies have their collective stories which helps them stay together as a society. Uh, we call it history and it helps pass down tradition and, and keep the cohesiveness of a society. Sometimes the, the histories are not exactly accurate, but, but everybody buys into it. It's mythology, it's legend, it's religion, it's entertainment, it's everywhere, everywhere around a story is so prevalent, it's ubiquitous. We don't even see it, but every moment of our lives is Im immersed in story. It's as important as the food we breathe, uh, the food we eat, sorry, the air we, we could breathe your food, I guess. The food we eat, the air we breathe, and we, everybody that's watching this right now is completely addicted to it. And we're addicted to it. We crave it so much that we pay all kinds of significant amounts of money to experience it. You know, film, television, novels, Corey's book, um, uh, you know, uh, games, comics, everything, the, all the entertainment that's based around story, we open our wallets and we pay money for that. It's, it's, and we are addicted to it because a well-structured story creates emotion. And emotion is our most basic primal instinct for survival. And I so- know human beings are naturally drawn to emotion. And I'm gonna stop you there because there's there's another question that's coming up that's gonna go right into that. But before we do that, Corey, I know that you uh, teach creative strategies to mm -hmm. uh, help people find and develop their own stories. Mm -hmm. um, what, are the, what are those strategies? Secret, you want the secret? Yeah, totally. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> um, so here's, here's what I, I want to just kind of build on what Lisa was just saying, because I think um, there's a lot of great wisdom in there in terms of the prevalence of stories everywhere. And so to answer your question in terms of like um, personal storytelling, um, I kind of think there's this thing that happens when you ask people, if you were to just say like, tell me a story, a lot of people get like sort of this stage fright of like, I don't have a story. I don't know any stories but then you just have conversation with them and you talk about something that happened this morning and that leads into some anecdotal memory that they had. And we are basically full of stories. We are all chock full, like every moment that we live, everything that we're doing uh, has sort of like, I don't wanna say like everything is a story because it is not. There's a lot of people who tell you things that happen and they are not stories. Yeah. They are weird anecdotes that have no ending, um, <laughs> but there's potential. And I strongly believe that part of like the craft of, of studying story and becoming like a storyteller is to kind of identify those things. So if you use what Lisa was just talking about, about like basic structures of stories of act structures or reversals or beginnings, middles and ends and sort of like the fundamental building blocks of what stories are. And then we look at our own lives, our own experiences and we will find that we have tons of those but it just takes sort of like a a trigger, some sort of incentive to be like remembering that moment and then going and having that light bulb turn on. So like a lot of what I like to do with my own stuff and with other people is basically like kind of improv-esque exercises, it's not improv games, but they sort of come from the world of improv, which is the idea of 
saying yes to your own ideas, not like listening to the critic that sits on your shoulder and says, that's a stupid idea. Yeah. Um, because we can all come up with like, oh, I got an idea for a thing about a mouse. Oh, nobody likes mice. Okay, then you're whacking that mole and you're starting another story. Oh, how about it's about a giraffe? No, 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 giraffe, that's too difficult to model. We're not gonna make a giraffe. Okay, mm-hmm. so if you just keep saying no over and over, then you ultimately crush all of your creativity. But if you play sort of the game of, I'm gonna say yes to that and see where it goes, Mm -hmm. then what you will discover, whether you're doing this by yourself as a creative or with a partner, with a friend, is that stories can kind of flow out of you and you'll you'll separate. This is kind of a fundamental thing for me, is really separating, coming up with ideas and critiquing or editing those ideas. That's true. I mean, I, I think a lot of people actually do it simultaneously and yeah. it's and you know you just don't get anything done that way i mean it's all even as a i mean even as a producer i sit there and i'll start producing development in my own head and i'm like yeah. no 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 it's not that they're separate um yeah. but um marcus well, call it, things- some people call it like a vomit draft like vomit out the first yeah. thing get the bad version out first don't critique it don't fix it just get something out Mm-hmm. And then you can go back and kind of look at it and adjust it and build on that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and Marcus, I wanted to talk to you about your short, uh, The the Signal. Um, I actually watched that. I've actually seen that a few times now. It's actually, <laughs> I, I, I totally enjoy that. Um, you did some sub, uh, some substantial world building there. It's its its, its own universe. Um, and... Uh, you know, is that the one you were talking about? Is the signal the long short film that you made? No, no, this is that was my yeah. that was kind of my last short film after I'd learned all the lessons. It was seven minutes total. <laughs> no, and it's no, but but you take those seven minutes and you like you cram a lot into it, but in a good way. Like it has its own natural uh, flow. As a director, do you ever process for finding the story you want to tell? Well, typically as a director, I come up with a very basic idea first. I want to tell a story about vampires or something like that, right? And then you're like, well, what's what specifically about that? And then you have your whatever your hook is, you know, my vampires are X, Y, or Z. And that's all you have. And then my theory with storytelling is just to take a big swing, right? Because when it's in your head, there's no budget. There's no, you know, creative exec giving you notes. You can imagine whatever you want. So I just always, and that doesn't mean expensive, right? Like, I feel like um, some examples are like uh, some horror movies because they're easier, like It Follows. That's a movie that's a really big swing, but it's a really small movie. The Ring is a really big swing, but it's very easy to understand. I mean, even The Matrix is a big swing from a tiny concept. You know what I mean? Humans are batteries in the future. And then you go from there. So my story crafting style is to come up with the hook, which normally starts with what if. What if, blah, blah, blah. And then I go, how far can we take it? Let's start there and whittle it down as we need to, right? So when I made the signal, it was about this guy, it was about a world in which, you know, there was an energy issue and there was a new form of energy, but it had negative effects. Mm -hmm. So how far can you take that? It could just be a dude with a superpower, right? Mm -hmm. But instead of that, let's build the world out, right? It's rather than, I mean, there's nothing wrong with superpower movies. I mean, I do lots of those episodes, but Mm -hmm. rather than just, I can fly, maybe it's, here's what happened to me when I was 10 and I fell off a cliff, but my dad had given me this thing and I didn't hit the ground. I levitated. And then, and so then you just go, and then, and you know, and then this happened, but that happened and this happened, yada, yada, yada. So that's how I normally come up with my, the story ideas that I craft myself. So you basically just are, are making sure that you don't limit yourself um, prematurely. Right, you're just like going in there and everything. I think the only limit that I give myself is I would say people much smarter than me have <laughs> spent years and years discover, discovering and analyzing story as a craft. Like there are people whose jobs it were to understand 
the uh, forensics of story, right? Okay. And that actually is a perfect setup for Lisa Cook. My next question to you <laughs> was, how do stories affect us uh, physiologically and psychologically? Um, great question. Um, so it turns out that our addiction and or preference for story is not some sort of haphazard things. The human, our brains are actually hardwired for story. Our brains react differently when we hear a story than any other kind of data or information. So when we hear information, what happens um, is two areas of our brain light up, Wernicke's and Broca. Those are our language processing um, areas of the brain. Super important, but that's about it. That's, that's what we're doing in our brain. When we hear a story, it ignites our entire brain, the motor cortex, the frontal cortex, the sensory cortex. And so what that means, we are experiencing the story as if we are actually physically experiencing it. Our, our brains at that moment are not differentiating between reality and the, imagine, the imagination. So when we read or hear or watch or click on a story, it puts our entire brain to work. It also changes our blood chemistry. So what happens when you hear a story, um, it raises your oxytocin, your dopamine and your cortisol. And those things are uh, cause emotion. So when your cortisol, which causes anxiety and your oxytocin, which creates empathy, come to a certain level and meet. It's what they call narrative transportation. So that's why if you're in a um, movie theater and you're watching a scary movie and the hair on the back of your neck's going up and you're clutching the seats or the person next to you and, you, and you're scared, that's what's happening to you. Your oxytocin and your cortisol have, have actually physiologically changed because we're watching the scary movie, but none of it is real. The people are actors. The story isn't real. It's all made up. Um, they've done some tests on that. And there was one test done by a guy named Paul Zak. He's a neuroscientist where he showed uh, a, a, an audience two different stories. And I'll tell you the first story. This first story is about a little boy named Ben. Ben is about four years old. And Ben, the story starts out as playing in his backyard. He's feeling pretty good. Ben's just undergone his last round of chemo and he's feeling you know, playful and fun. And then there's Roger, his father, who's watching him play. And Roger's sort of removed and sad. And the reason Roger's removed and sad is he knows something that Ben doesn't know, that Ben is dying and Ben's only got two months to live. And the story goes on about how his, it's his goal to try to be with his son even and overcome his sadness to be with this little boy um, in his last few months. And so his, he has to grapple with his own conflict, inner conflict. And finally, he finds a way to get over his own pain and be with his son and be with Ben until he takes his last dying breath two months later. Now, if any of you are feeling really sad right now, uh, yeah, <laughs> I have just I have just raised your oxytocin level, which is our the, what what happens to our blood when we feel empathy, um, and I have also raised your cortisol level, which level which causes anxiety. So that's an ex, that's a uh, example of what happens to us when we are told a story in a in a certain three act structure with an arc and a theme and um, empathetic characters. Um, so it, it, it's not just a psychological thing that happens to, it's an actual physiological change because story, unlike any other form of communication, creates emotion. A well-toed cra crafted story creates um, emotion in us. And that's the, what happens. The, the thing that I, I actually love about this is that what it does do is um, it puts in different context that um, reaction or feeling or whatever that we've all had from different movies, right? Be it Star Wars, be it Marvel or whatever. Like we're all chasing that moment to where we lean into it and just 
we're so into the movie. We're so, so into it. I've never heard it put into a context of actual, like, you know, a dopamine cascade. But I mean, that makes so much sense. Right. Um, and dopamine is the thing that helps us remember. There's cortisol is anxiety. Dopamine helps us remember and pay attention. And um, uh, cortisol, without, I mean, without oxytocin, we would not be a society because it's the thing that makes us feel empathy for others mm -hmm. and therefore help others and become a society and the human race can then perpetrate itself, right? Yeah. Um, and just to finish up that real quickly, the, the experiment. So he, she, he told that, he, sh he showed a video of that story to a group, gave them all some money. And he said, at the end of the story, I want you to you know, give as much money as you want to a children's cancer charity. When people watched that story, they gave like 80% of their money away. Then they had a control group where they just showed Ben and his father playing at a park, having fun together, seeing the giraffes, going off to see the rhinos, but there was no story. So nobody's, uh, nobody felt anything Therefore, um, then nobody gave any money. Yeah. One other quick thing I just want to talk about is neural coupling. This is the other thing that happens when you're telling a really good story. The brains of everybody listening to your story sync, sync up. It's called neural coupling. And then what happens to the person telling the story, all those brains sync to you and they're mirroring your story. So if you want somebody to really pay attention, tell a good story, they're, all their brains will be in sync. They'll all be paying attention. They'll be thinking about the story. If you're just talking about information, that doesn't happen. People are thinking about lots of different things. And if they can sync up with your brain, then you've got them. You've got them really sucked into the story. So, the, so you know, we've all been in those movie theaters, right? Where everyone applauds when something blows up. Um, you're saying they were all, they're all in sync. They all, they neurologically Everybody there. Sync. Yeah, that's why you can sometimes hear a collective <gasps> in the audience oh, yeah. because the brains are synced up. Everybody's right there with the story. They're all being, um, they're all experiencing narrative transportation at the same time. So you know, it's, it dawns on me. And, and this question uh, is going to you, Corey, is that um, with our love of story and the fact that it's intrinsic to everything we do and how we communicate, um, it strikes me that everybody has the ability to tell good stories, but I'm, I myself get hung up. Like when you come, when it sits, when I sit down and try to put pen to paper and start organizing things, why, why do people get hung up when they're trying to create a story? Uh, great question. Uh, I think especially, well, this is in a couple of contexts, but talking about invented stories, like what Marcus was talking about, about like finding like, what's the hook of this story, but then having to figure out like, but then what happens? What comes next? What comes next? You know, where, where, how did that story kind of climax? Or sometimes harder, like memoir writing or coming up with your own stories because our lives can feel like this kind of continuum of like, there's no ending because it's like this thing just led to another thing, which led to another thing. And so what I, what I like to kind of hook onto is the idea that stories are fundamentally about, about change, about something went from one state to another, whether it's a big change, you know, like uh, apart to together or um, injustice to justice or a small change. Like I went from, um, you know, not knowing what to have for dinner to deciding what to order on the menu. Like it could be a micro decision that a story could be developed within that and finding what that is. And so there's one like really useful kind of shorthand tool that I recommend everybody learn. Um, it's this thing called the story spine by a guy named Ken Adams, who's a San Francisco based like director, writer, actor, improviser. And it's basically seven sentences that are sentence starts that anyone can basically use to invent your own story. And they're, they're going to sound very familiar, but it's like once upon a time and every day until one day, you know, just like these are like the things that construct a story. So if you are trying to think of a story and you start with a once upon a time of like, what is the world of the story? And every day, like, what is the normal in this world? Like, what is normal for you or for this character until one day something changed? And it is that trigger of that sort of until one day that for an audience, for like Lisa's Ben story, like 
until we found out and he's got cancer. Like all yeah. of a sudden now we're, we're interested because it was a father and a son, but now it's a dying kid. Yeah. So we're curious. So like all of our neuro synchronistic, whatever there was the word, neuro, <laughs> neuro, neuro coupling. We were all neuro coupled. We wanted to know what's going to happen to the kid. Does he live or does he die? So yeah. now there's a question that that's the hook effectively of that story. We want to know, does he live or does he die? And ultimately it sounds like he dies, right? Oh. He dies. Well, yeah. he can live. You can make him live. That's fine. But I'm just saying it's okay if he dies because the story you ultimately- can't kill off the dies. kid. No, we're not killing it. And I know he doesn't exist, but you can't kill off the imaginary kid. <laughs> I'm killing Ben. I just killed Ben and here's why. Oh. Because ultimately the Ben story isn't about Ben. Ben's story is about Ben's dad. Changing from Ben's dad's a busy dad got a lot going on doesn't spend you know cats in the cradle okay and then at the end of the story ben dies but ben's dad learns something you know it's a it's about that so finding our finding our way through that yeah. and when we have that and we have we have uh, at least something to hang our story on and then we can insert emotion and we can insert science fiction or whatever we want but we've got to have that if you don't have the spine of that story somebody is in some state and in the end ever since that day they are changed in some way. Um, uh, you got nothing. Yeah. You know, what's interesting is I'm really upset that Ben died. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> my version. That was my version. I killed Ben. Yeah. But you know him. Ben lives, honey. He lives. I'm, I'm just There's like, you people. know. There's ben too. I'm like, you know, I know, I know. We just made that up. But I'm like, no, no, no. He's, he's somewhere. He's happy. Um, <laughs> One more game that's I actually just learned this recently that's super yeah. fun for like inventing stories and this works really well for people that, that have kids. Yeah. It's a story that it's a game that, that my friend Ben Johnson invented. It's basically like you have somebody else tell you a story, like especially a kid. You're like, tell me a story. Like, and then whenever they get stuck, um, they say to you, they go, um, what comes next? Or what then what happens? And so whatever you say, they that person goes exactly and has to keep basically integrate whatever that thing is into their story and then keep going with the story until they get stuck and then they go what comes next and then you say what it is and go, exactly so um if you're like making up a story for your kid like mm -hmm. a bedtime story and you don't know what to say next just ask your kid what comes next they will know oh that's awesome that's yeah. amazing um and uh marcus um as we are exploring like how stories develop um, as a director, like how important is story and story development to, to what you do? I mean, like, how do you, I mean, how do you stories, develop your stories? Stories, stories, everything in terms of how I develop it. I mean, there is a couple things that I'd like to say just, you know, for the audience is that, you know, it's just every now and then you've got to be a little tangible, right? And it can't just story can't just live in this, you know, idea and these, these I mean, that's that I take nothing away from, like I said, the people's much smarter than me, but I'm about the boots on the ground. Let's get the story shot. Let's get this thing. I always thought like, you know, if I make a, in my case, it's always film, short film, feature film, television, whatever. If nobody wants to watch it, then I don't feel like I've done my job. So yeah. I'm looking to engage people and make successful stories. But I would say a couple of things and then I'll answer your question very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like every concept is good, right? Your job is to have the confidence to know that and to figure out what is the good version of the story from your concept, right? Meaning if I came up to you right now and you didn't know the history and you said, I've got this idea for dream bandits. And what they do is, is they, they go in and you, you fall asleep and they go in there and they take your dream and they find a bit of your memory and then they can steal stuff. You'd be like, ah, <laughs> right. That sounds so good. Love it. Yeah. Ah. Right. Ben died just right? Ben died. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Ben dies in the end of that one too. Oh, come yes. On. Ben dies in the end. So my, my point is right. You show me, you just, you have to have confidence in your story because in, in Hollywood, at least you show somebody Citizen Kane, they'll tell you what's wrong with it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? So you just yeah. have to, you have to live and die by, you have to learn how to craft these stories and then stick to your guns. Yeah. So for me, like Corey, I, I, I think, 
that there's so much literature about how story is made. You just find one that you like, yeah. right? Corey just gave his example of the story spine. I tend to use the Save the Cat Blake Snyder method because mm -hmm. that re happens to resonate with me because mm -hmm. again, like the fewer the number is, the more I like it, yeah. right? <laughs> You have these, oh, you're going to make a movie. It's got 47 index cards. You're like, what are you talking about? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Corey's example had seven. I think Save the Cat has 13. Yeah. It's like opening image, theme stated, setup, catalyst, uh, break, I skipped one, break in the two, midpoint, bad guys, you know, bad guys close in. But yeah. it's very simple. You can look at any movie and you can understand that structure. So all I'm saying is, for me, I've picked a structure that works for me. And that happens to be the save the cat structure. I know that my core idea is good. So I'll, the only work is getting from the core idea to the save the cat structure that I know works, right? Gotcha. Because, because again, and this will be the last thing I say about this is there's a formula to this stuff. Like we, it's not magic, right? There's a reason that Shonda Rhimes makes seven different television shows and they're all hits because there's a rhythm to it. Yeah. So really, if you wanna be a professional storyteller, meaning someone who writes books, someone who directs movies, someone who writes movies, you have to find the structure that works for you and just rinse and repeat. Yeah. Um, this brings me to my next thing. Lisa? Yeah, yeah. Um, so as we are figuring out that there are several different ways to get there, um, are there some basic elements that just make a story work? Well, there's many different um, structures for story. There's mm -hmm. three act, five act, there's circular stories. A lot of different cultures have different stories. Mythology has different uh, structure than um, uh, uh, classic uh, Greek uh, structure. Mm -hmm. uh, but, the, but the structure that I, I like to start with is um, the three act structure because it's the easiest to, to wrap your head around. And, you know, it's the most common. And, um, you know, Steven Spielberg didn't invent it. It was invented by Aristotle. And if you read the POEX, he figured it out. And Hollywood has used it ever since to great success. And um, so the, it, the three act structure is sort of the basic, the base rock of it. It's like, it's like baking a cake. You want to, you want to find the recipe that works best for you, but then you want to follow some basic baking rules and, and bake a, a good cake. Um, the, the, the parts of a story that are, I mean, I, you could, I could teach a two week course on story structure, but the, the real, if you want to just get it down to its basic level, mm -hmm. a story is a protagonist who has a goal confront and confronts obstacles and must get over those obstacles to reach their goal or not. But along the way, they've changed in some way. They've learned something, they've attained their goal. Sometimes their goal is not what they think it is. Sometimes they think they want something, but it's not really what they want. What they really want is something, what they really need. There's what they want and what they need. But what they've learned along the way, how that character has changed from act one, the setup, to act three, the resolution, that change in that character is what we call the dramatic arc. And that represents the theme of your uh, story. Yeah. And a story without a theme is just a pattern of, it's just, a, it's just empty events. It, yeah. you, there's got to be something, the plot is what people leave in the theater, the theme is what they take home with them. Um, for example, here's a, here's a, here's a little log line for a, a movie. A family is a victim of a home invasion and only the father and the son survive. And the son is horribly injured in the attack because the, and because of this, the father's been traumatized. He's become fearful and very overprotective of his son. So when the son grows up and runs away, the father must find his inner courage to find him and bring him home. And in the end, the journey changes his point of view. He realizes that he must allow his son to take risks in order to live his life fully. So that's a, that's a thematic line, encourage courage, overcoming fear, mm -hmm. or, or the lesson that you have to take risks to live life fully. 
And that movie is Finding Nemo. Uh -huh. And that's where P Pixar is so brilliant. Every single one of their movies, even though they might be made for kids, have a overarching thematic line that resonates with adults too. Um, they spend a lot of time on that. So, you know, story basic structure, act one, the setup, act two, the rising action where the hero's off on his journey fighting the battles and act three is the resolution. Not unlike our daily thing, we get out of bed, it's a setup, have our breakfast, have our coffee, go out and have all the things, all the obstacles in our day that we have to overcome. And from all overcoming all those obstacles in our daily life, we come home and we have learned something. You know, we can yeah. we can come back to the thing. It's that it's that uh, it's that hero's journey. That's what Campbell would call it. Um, but you know, and and that pattern really resonates with people. Yeah. That's there's a lot of ways to break those rules. But like I said, Picasso was a classically trained artist before he became a cubist. So it's good to learn the basic structure of a story and then you can break the rules. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because when, when you were talking about story structure mirroring our lives and so forth and we get out of bed, we go to work, do whatever. I think it's one of the things that I kept thinking over the past year was I was like, this is not my story, right? <laughs> like I did not write this story, you know? And um, I think that actually resonated, I think that a lot of people actually felt that way. Um, Corey, one of, the, one of the things I wanted to can ask I, you about- One thing really quickly, can I just add huh? one thing? Really oh, quick. absolutely. Really quickly, yeah. Um, because I just want to make sure that we're again. Uh, I feel like everyone who is watching this has tried to write something, right? A screenplay or whatever. So if we use the um, the story is my day, right? Yeah. Everyone would get lost around twelve thirty. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right? yeah. right? yeah. Everybody at twelve thirty would go. Now what happens to me? Yeah. Right. So I think what's really important is that. You know, the reason that when we wake up every day, we make it home, right? We mm -hmm. know where we're going is because yeah. there's uh, there is a primal context to which that day happens, yeah. right? A primal context, right? Mm -hmm. So there's something that we want. I need money, so I have to go to work, so I can do the blah, 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 right? If it's just, you know, one, I have this story about a person, he's going to grow up, and then in the midpoint, he's going to change. I feel like that's why we get lost. But that's why the protagonist must keep his eye on the goal. The, the, the goal is the linchpin. So it's set up, the protagonist has a goal he must reach. That's what drives the, the act two forward. A story is uh, created by a causal relationship, cause and effect, cause and effect, mm -hmm. cause and effect. And the obstacles towards that goal get worse, get, get more and more challenging until the, the protagonist reaches an apex and he must give it everything to reach that goal. So if the protagonist has a, has a clear goal and you know where he's going as a writer, then you won't get lost in the mess in the middle. You won't get lost in that act two mess. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't, I don't disagree with anything you're saying. I'm just, I'm just saying that most of the people that are listening to this are probably not you know, successful Hollywood novelists, writers, whatever. They're learning to tell these stories and I think you would agree that most people run into trouble somewhere along that journey, yeah. typically in the middle of the second act. Oh yeah, no, right? absolutely. And so all I'm really trying to do is reinforce uh, what, you know, what Corey was suggesting, what I was suggesting that, you know, when you're first starting out, when you're trying to learn the rules, pick a system, right? Yeah. Just pick a system that, that resonates with you and that yeah. will help you get at least from 1230 to 445. Yeah. You know yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, you know what's what's interesting though about this is that, you know, we if we're looking at stories and they have these three act structures and there's there's certain similarities that all of these stories have that that we actually fall in love with. Um, some stories wow people more than others, and uh, Corey, I know that you have been teaching techniques to uh, to your folks of how to wow an audience like how do you how do you instill that in and in, in people you're working with well i mean i can i can probably answer this but i would also be interested in what 
the other panelists have to say about this, but I think that to to like to wow an audience, you have to basically do two things. You have there has to be something surprising in the story that they did not expect or they didn't see coming. Like there's got to be some element that they didn't see coming. But also there's relatability. They have to be able to see themselves in the story. If they don't, then you've lost them. You know, uh, I see a lot of true stories told at the Moth, where um, they come in and it's like a very high status. How awesome they are! They're great and if they don't fuck up and something goes horribly wrong, then I hate that person. Like if it just starts out about how great they are and then the end of the story and then this amazing thing happened, the end, thank you. Everybody's like, yeah, goodbye. Um, we, you know, like everyone loves an underdog story. Everybody likes a story about overcoming some kind of an obstacle. So generally speaking, you know, if you can't relate to somebody suffering in some way or mm -hmm going through something that you can relate to, even if it's not an exact, like I've never been Neo in the matrix, but I know what it's like to be misunderstood. Yeah. I know what it's like to feel like there's something going on. I don't understand what it is. So I can in some way put myself into a character in that movie and relate to something, even if the situation is, is crazy. You know, I've always wondered about that. So relatability is a big thing in surprise. You know, if your story is without any kind of surprise, there's something wrong with your story. Yeah. You know? um, and usually though by the time you're writing a story that's like I think what Marcus was talking about as the hook that's the reason why you started writing that story that's the reason where you're like there's this is something that's worth talking about because there's some fundamental idea that would be cool so like another trick that I like to use is sort of writing from the end of the story it's yeah. something that Mike Probiglia talks about too a lot is like I know where the story is going to end I know the funny thing that happens at the end of the story so working backwards from that, like let's rewind now to like, what was life before we got to that funny thing? So that by the time I get to that funny thing in the end, I've built up to that. And then that last thing can just be funny or profound or touching or whatever the sort of core that you're going for. Yeah, no, absolutely. But again, I'm gonna throw it to, can I throw it to Marcus and Lisa and see what they- Absolutely. Because I, 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 I well, I guess I guess I'll go first. Unless uh, actually, ladies first. Lisa, go ahead. No, go ahead. You go ahead. Um. Okay. Uh. I mean, I guess one thing. I mean, just a little sidebar. I mean, this is the BES. Like everybody's super smart in here. Like let's yeah. just call a spade a spade here. Mm -hmm. These are animators and coders mm -hmm. and compositors, and they solve problems on a level that the layman can't understand every day. Yeah. So I just feel like. You know, most of this stuff that we're talking about, like most people who are watching this probably know they haven't, they may not have uh, looked at it in this way, but I feel like everybody has kind of experienced all this and has uh, been working on a scene or a shot or a movie where mm -hmm. they've analyzed this at a, at a frame level because of our job, right? So uh, all that to say, I mean, what, makes one story better than another what makes one story wow someone and and not the other mm -hmm. um my take on that is is again very pragmatic right yeah. it can't be boring right it's very easy to look at a story and see where the boring bits are yeah. right but i think the person who is the best at this in my opinion is going to be jj abrams nobody hate you know, any jj abrams haters <laughs> I'm just saying you can go to any J.J. Abrams movie and there'll always be that one scene that is purely exposition. And in that scene, they put something super exciting for no other reason than to make that scene exciting. There's a scene <laughs> I was doing a movie, one of the last VFX films I worked on was Into Darkness, Star Trek Into Darkness. Oh, yeah. And there's a scene where the, where the very smart blonde female doctor and Bones go down to the surface because they want to look at this... Uh, they want to look at this bomb, right? Mm -hmm. And they're talking about the bomb and who's in the bomb. And there's some, I think the exposition is, oh, the, uh, you know, we don't know what this bomb is and we don't know exactly what this capsule is. And then suddenly the door closes on Bone's arm and it's going to blow up, right? Yep. <laughs> now it's not blowing up for any reason except to keep that exposition from being super boring. Yeah. Because I feel like J.J. Abrams does a really good job. This happens in his Mission Impossible, his Star Trek, is Star Wars, they look through it and they go, ha, huh, there's kind of a slow bit right here. We either need to cut it down, put something exciting in it, add something thematic, yada, yada, yada. So I just feel like that's how, that's how stories grab people and that's 
how I think that J.J. Abrams makes sure to keep people wild. Nice. Yeah. Lisa? Well, I'm all about an empathetic character, a really interesting, great character, and a strong theme. I think those are two things that really keep people uh, uh, engrossed in a film and um, remember a film after they see it. Um, you know, like they say, plot you leave in the theater, the theme you take home with you. Um, so I'm a big proponent of a strong protagonist, flawed but strong, and a um, a, a strong dramatic arc. And and um, I think it all starts with theme. I really do. If it if you don't have a some sort of archetype that people can relate to, then you're just it's just sort of an empty empty series of events in my in my opinion. Um, but I, I wanted really to add. I wanted question. to add. I, I'm sorry. I just had a really quick question for you that's on this topic. And uh, since uh, you're more of a story guru than I, than I am, do you feel like, uh, I apologize, uh, moderator, for- No, dude, for no, dude, it's a conversation. But, it's like, no, but I feel like I feel like certain genres are easier to wow than others. Meaning there is, in my opinion, there's always been a pit in the semi-autobiographical coming of age film yeah. where it's harder to wow someone in that than it is in a horror movie or a comedy Absolutely. or some genre base. And Absolutely. I, I wondered they've got, they've got the actual, um, you know, that's where you get back to what you said. Find something, find a structure that works for you and stick to that structure because this structure is not um, just some haphazard thing. This, this structure, the structure works. And so if you are creating the twists and you're creating, you know, a empathetic character, it doesn't matter the genre, in my opinion. You can have a scary horror movie, but if you don't give a sorry poop about the characters, then you're you're not going to be you're not going to be invested. You know, if if the person that's going to get killed by the monster is kind of a bland character, you're not you're not going to be going along with the thing. It's a bland character. I want them to die. Yeah, like, exactly. Right. Exactly. Uh, and then the story gets interesting. But and then I, I, I wanted to talk about one other thing. And I know David, you might've had it on your list, but it's a, it's a trick. It's a shortcut for people when that are trying to write a story. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, it comes from Trey Parker. If anybody doesn't know who Trey Parker is, creator of South Park. And he has to write episodes in extremely short periods of time. They have just a few days to write a whole episode. So he came up with this shortcut. And he said, I write something out, then I look at my writing. And if my writing is this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, I go back in and I use the ABT rule. I go, this happened, and this happened, but then this happened, therefore this happened. Because it helps you move the story in a way that can cause twists and turns and, and explore the unexpected, right? I was sitting at my desk, but then the roof caved, caved in. So therefore I had to crawl out of the house. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's just a, um, it's a real interesting tool when you're writing to just check yourself. Are you just doing too many scenes that are and, 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 and where, and throw those butts and therefores in there, throw your butt in there um, and, and your therefores and, and make a really good YouTube video of Trey and Matt talking about that. It's actually very funny. Yeah, it is. It's a, it's a, but it's a great tool for especially for new writers because it helps you change direction, not just get so sucked into your story that you have in your head that you're not looking at what could happen here, but that could happen, right? And give some more life to your story. Or actually, yeah, there's a Q and A window here. Okay. All right, not to be a dork, but like when I open this up, does that mean everybody can actually? Like where, no. or, or is it coming in the chat window? No. E well, either. I don't think anybody submitted a question yet. So if people do have questions, I'd say go ahead and put them in the chat. Otherwise, we'll, we can. Yeah, somebody said, here is a test question. Oh, that's Mark. Marcus. Hi. That was me. <laughs> oh, nice. Nice. Okay. I love it. Seriously, does no one have any questions? I mean, so oh. if you have a question, you, you type it in the chat and then we will we'll, we'll answer it. Um, Aaron Rhodes. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron. 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 Aaron's asking, how did Ben die? And can we elaborate? <laughs> <laughs> I know. 
I it, know. It, it, I, was a, it was a slow and painful death. Yes, exactly. Days. Exactly. Um, so he did not die of the cancer that he had. No, he died in a slow <laughs> motion accident. Yeah. There was this plane that had this big load of bricks above his head. Yeah. Just <laughs> missed him. Um, Joe Wiedenbach. I hope I said that properly. I do. Uh, uh, this question is for everyone. Uh, where do you start developing your characters when you've only gotten a rough treatment done? Uh, I guess I'll take a crack at that one. For me, yeah. that's actually pretty easy, right? Because I normally come up with the story of the hero, right? Right after uh, Once Upon a Time or What If, right? I have a hero character. And then for the hero to do his things, he needs these other characters to exist. So yeah. most of the time, my, my uh, characters are developed by the needs of the hero, right? Mm -hmm. He needs a love interest. He needs a foe. He needs, uh, so a, a great example is um, uh, Ellen Page in Inception. I know I've used that movie twice, but Ellen Page in Inception is only there so that we can understand the rules of the world, right? That's why that character exists. So in the universe of him creating that story, he's like, these are very complex concepts. And the only way to explain it is to introduce a new character into it who we have to explain it to, yeah. right? Yeah. So that's why Ellen, that's the only reason she's there, right? Mm -hmm. She's not like the best maze builder in the world. or what. She's only there to be like, Who's this woman who always tries to kill me? How do this dreams work? Why is it falling apart? Yeah. So that is yeah, a good example. Of the character in WandaVision, who's like the coder character in WandaVision. Oh yeah. Yes. She defined, this is, let me define this crazy thing in this crazy world now. Sorry for yeah. those of you who haven't watched it. No, yeah, there's no spoilers though. Um, no, yeah, but she's like the audience surrogate. And I get yeah. that, like, I totally what's get going that. On? So she's a character, like having a character that's like, wait, what's going on? allows us to be like, whole, talk, talk to, right? Like explain to. Yeah. Like, well, I always do it backwards like that. You know, I need, I have this hero character. I need a foe that could defeat him. It's like Sherlock and Moriarty, right? He's got to be, so he can't be just some schlub. He's got to yeah. be the boss monster. I need mm -hmm. a character who can give him the golden egg that helps him when he's all the way down. Who could that be? Then you get the Oracle in the Matrix, yeah. right? I need a character to go to, to like, mm -hmm. who is like a godlike figure to tell me whether or not I'm the one, yeah, right? Yeah. And then the oracle's born. Mm -hmm. So I always do it backwards. I don't know if that's the right way. That's just the way okay. I get it. No, that's, that's, that's. Um, we have very, 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 very an very anonymous big. attendee has asked a question. Their question <laughs> is, what is the difference between this, between this and this, and this happened from, this happened, then this caused this to happen. I'm not entirely sure about that question. If somebody else understands that, then. Well, I, I think, understand yeah, yeah. But I think, go ahead. I think Lisa understands it better than I do. So a, a plot is created by cause and effect, Yeah. right? Cause, go outside, it's raining. Okay, so that's the effect. It's cold and, and wet. I see a, uh, an old woman that, that doesn't have an umbrella, right? I give her my umbrella, cause and effect. So because I don't have an umbrella, I catch a cold. And then because I have a cold, I go to the hospital because I, I, I'm afraid of getting pneumonia. And because I'm at the hospital, I meet the doctor who's this big, hunky, amazing doctor and he becomes the love of my life. That's the cause and effect. So mm -hmm. it's this happens and this, it's this happens but then this happens. And then, so this happens. It's not just a straight line. These things are related. It's, it's a causal relationship. You just don't have random things happening. Like I walked down the street and I saw a dime, I picked it up. So I kept walking. And then um, I noticed how blue the sky was. And that was really interesting. So I took my shirt off and, you know, it, it, it you have to have that real strong connection of cause and effect changing the course of the of the plot. Yeah. Um, if the plot keeps going this way, it's not going to be interesting. You want your plot to have some twists and turns, just like Marcus was saying. You want to yeah. create 
twists and turns to engage your audience. I so. think I think uh, the action item from this question from anonymous attendee is you should look at the story as as a whole as an outline which is kind of what Corey was saying with the spine and then work your way to the details and I think when people fall into this happened then this happened and this happened then this happened is they're just meandering down the road and they don't exactly know where they're going but Maybe it would be cool if he woke up and he had a sandwich. And then after that, you know, his girlfriend came home. And then after that, they don't, I feel like you fall into that pattern when you don't know where you're headed. Yeah. Right. So I feel like if you look at the story as a whole and you're like, um, you can see the whole thing, then you can start to think about, okay, well, I've got this pretty interesting set of events here. Now, what's the theme? And then you go to that next level. Right. Mm -hmm. So like Die Hard. It's just some dude who came from uh, from New York to LA and then he had to <laughs> play out of a building, right? Mm -hmm. But then you're like, but why? Why is he there? Well, his ex-wife is there. Why is she his ex-wife? Well, because it didn't work out. Well, maybe, <laughs> you know, and yeah. that gets you to the second and third tier. So I, I'm a big proponent of outlining your face off, right? Outline, 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 outline because moving things around is a lot more malleable. And that's something I learned from failure, right? Originally I was a big vomit draft guy, but I would start vomit, vomiting and not know where I was going, yeah. right? <laughs> so I just outline until we're blue in the face because mm -hmm. the outline, and I'll be a little practical here, but the outline is the pitch, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. What you're selling, like today I, I've, I've been pitching this new feature that, uh, that I came up with myself and today I had a pitch and the pitch was the outline, mm -hmm. right? I haven't yeah. written a word of yeah. the script, yeah. not a word, but we've outlined it so well that I could say, here's the story and we open here and then he does this and then that happens. So then he has to move all the way to here. Now what's he gonna do? So that's why I'm a big proponent of the outlining because when you're done with the outline, you have a pitch. Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually a big proponent of, of not writing. Like of developing that's like sort of like my improv background thing is basically like what you were talking about is just like just tell the story and like tell it and see how it kind of comes out mm -hmm. and that's basically what a pitch is it's like telling somebody the story and then the more you tell that story the more it kind of evolves and you watch people that you tell it to and watch where they seem interested and where they're checking their watch and where they seem bored or whatever mm -hmm. and the more i do that the more i kind of track what's working about a story the trouble that i have again with like writing the story is once i start to write it i fall in love with my words and then it becomes really hard to change those so i work in a very similar way to that which is that i'm outlining but i'm basically outlining by narrating it by like thinking it out loud and finding the version that works and then once i've got kind of like a verbal uh beat by beat version then i take that sort of to a draft into an outline I, th I think, you know, different things work for different people. I've worked with writers who absolutely cannot outline. It just com completely destroys their creative juices. Mm -hmm. I worked with people that love to outline and outline every detail. So it's where your comfort zone is, where, you, where, where your brain is lit up and your, and your story is flowing. But, you know, I do tell people, know your, know your protagonist, know the goal they, they think they want, the goal they want, know the goal they need mm -hmm. and know where you're going, know where, you know, know that, know your ending. No, you can't climb a mountain without knowing where the summit is. And you want to have some sort of spine of your story. You want to have a, a, a trail map, but you don't yeah. have to catalog every rock and tree on the way up. It's, some people that really works for, some people it, it paralyzes to try to outline. So again, like Marcus said, find, find the, um, the thing that works for you, whether it's save the cat or improv, mm -hmm. whatever gets your creative juices, that's the way to approach it. But know structure, know where you're going, um, know the rules that there are, then, then you can break them. So uh, but I, I personally find outlining a, a super tool. Um, it just doesn't work for everybody. Yeah. Speaking of knowing your ending, um, I wanted, um, we are a little bit over. I wanted to thank everyone uh, for coming this evening. Um, we have one more question. We should answer it before we end. We got one more question. Oh, we do? Yes. 
Oh, I didn't I scroll down. Hold, please. Aaron wrote. Oh, Aaron. Okay. Aaron, do the same rules of storytelling apply to different length pieces and formats? Film versus commercial, novel versus short story. Um, Market, you're probably all over this. Yeah, I'll take the film versus commercial because I don't have a lot of experience in novel. Um, but I would say in terms of film versus commercial, it depends on the commercial because there are some commercials that are narrative, but most of them are only loosely narrative, right? But I do think that having an understanding, I think in commercials, the story becomes what the viewer feels, right? It's yeah. not always there's a hero because sometimes the hero is a car, right? So what, you know, a lot of times in commercials, it's a lot more theme than it is action, right? But I think all the same rules apply. Like you can look at the storyboards for a commercial and be like, so what, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so how is this? I mean, that's the difference between, you know, those great Super Bowl ads and Volkswagen commercials that we, you know, that we remember um, and just, you know, the spot for the new Nissan, X, you know, Xterra, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, new lease, yeah. you know, 259. Like one of those is a, is a story and one of those is just information. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that they definitely, the rules definitely apply to features versus shorts, right? But the thing is when you're making a short, you're making a piece of a feature and just like a scene has a beginning and a middle and an end, right? Uh, a scene has a beginning and a middle and end, an act has a beginning, middle and end, a whole script, a whole movie has a beginning, middle and end. So when you're doing a short, you're doing a truncated beginning, middle and end. And obviously there's gonna be a whole lot at the beginning and a whole lot at the end, but you're just gonna do that one bit in the middle as good as you can do it. And you're gonna apply all these story rules to that short. Absolutely. Anyone, anyone here? Are we good? Nice. Okay. All right. Well, wait. The chat's going. Nope. Great seeing you guys. It's helpful to hear your insight to apply to our little germs of ideas that we're trying to flush out. Yes, David yes. Golly. Absolutely. I Just want to thank you. Be my, my last thing to say. Just have confidence because whatever your idea, there is a good story version of that idea. And if, as long as you know that, just don't quit until you get there. Yeah, great advice. No, it was, uh, can, yeah. can we can we leave off with story? Uh, Corey telling us a quick story. Well, an ILM story if you want to hear one. Okay. Yeah. All right. Here's my here's an ILM story. Um, so I, you know, like like a lot of people, I always loved Star Wars, and when I got hired at ILM, it was like insane. Like I'm working here at ILM. This is crazy. And then I was there around the time that the special edition started. Um, which was crazier because it wasn't just like working at ILM. It was like working on Star Wars, like the movie that that um, started it all. You know, and I was in Durval in these days. A lot of you knew me back in that time. And um, so for those of you who don't know, Dirt Removal was, we would load up frame by frame our images in Matador and we would go basically toggle between like two frames and everything was delivered to us on exabyte tape. We'd have to like load up the frames and toggle between two frames. And then if you like saw some Delta, you saw like a little pop that was dirt that was scanned in on the negative and we'd paint that out. And then you go to the next frame and, um, and then you eventually like watch everything play back and like it would be fine and it would get, you know, the, the real visual effects would happen. Yeah. But um, I was given a star field for the opening shot uh, and I was cleaning like stars that's black field with white dots. And I'm looking for like the white dots, you know, and like, you're just looking at like a little tiny corner of the frame. And then you're like going to the next one and you're going through frame by frame. And it's like maddening, right? And so like a lot of my life was just doing this and like you sort of get out of your brain and you're just doing this thing where you're cleaning frame by frame the film. And, um, and the next day I got, I got the, um, the shot where it's Jabba, that we were gonna add Jabba to the shot. And it's basically just a plate of, you know, Harrison Ford talking to that Irish actor in the big fur coat who probably thought he was going to be a big star when he saw Star Wars came out and then realized that he was cut from the film and then later completely replaced. But um, I went like frame by frame through the whole thing and I uh, cleaned the whole thing. And when I came back to like the, what do we call it, the abacus, the abbey, and like played back the frame sequence, I realized that there was a piece of dirt on Harrison Ford's ear 
in okay. every frame. And it actually wasn't dirt. I had completely removed his ear. <laughs> completely painted it out. And I realized it because I thought, like, I kept like, wow, it's weird that there's a piece of dirt there again, because then I keep going through the frame. And like I obliterated it and it's gone. <laughs> and then, but I was so young and stupid that I was like, if I tell someone, I might get in trouble, but they're smart, they'll figure it out. So I showed it to the supervisors and they're looking for like hits of hair and dirt. They're like, looks fine. So it's in the movie, like in the special edition <laughs> Star Wars. <laughs> I, I partly ruined, I, I got to ruin Star Wars. And, um, and so though it was my dream to work on Star Wars, uh, I also got to feel that crushing sense of, uh, of responsibility for ruining it a little And you bit. have removed an ear <laughs> from Star Wars lore. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Kevin is asking, it's the scene, it's the scene, it's in the special edition version, which I think might maybe was changed later. I don't know if there's anybody here who worked on the special special edition. Yeah. Is there like a 4K cut? Anyway. You know, at some um, point we should probably do another event of just like weird Star Wars stories. Because yeah. Marcus, I'm sure you've got a few episode one stories as well. I know I do and everything. So I'm not great. I know. Yeah, there we go. Um, <laughs> but we want, I want to thank everybody in the audience for attending. I yeah. want to thank all of you for being an amazing panel. Hang on, hang on. And uh, we are, this is the point where we actually get to tell, you know, like what we're working on uh, next. Corey, you are a brand new author. Hold up your book. What a and, book. Yeah, and tell people where they can get the book at. Oh, anywhere, anywhere. I am encouraging people to buy them from local bookstores. So if there's a bookstore in your neighborhood or in your town, wherever you are, um, uh, if you want to find uh, other book, like independent bookstores, yeah. my website, CoreyRosen.com has like BIPOC owned bookstores that I would love to throw business to. Um, if you need to buy it from Amazon, you could buy it from there too, but um, it's, it's in the world and it comes out March 30th. I just got, this came in the mail today. I got the actual book in the mail. So if I seem excited, I I you were literally the guy, yeah. you were literally the guy holding up your book. Congratulations. That's a big thing. <laughs> um, Marcus, what do you, what do you have coming up? Um, I guess the most exciting thing is I wrote a story loosely based on my upbringing. It's a kid's kind of karate kid type tale. Yeah. And um, this is the one that we've only outlined and we've been pitching and uh, we have pitched it so far to Disney, uh, Nickelodeon. And today we pitched it to Netflix and we've gotten, um, we're two for two. So Disney made an offer, Nickelodeon oh. made an offer. And we're hoping to hear if uh, we get the hat trick and um, Netflix makes an offer. Oh yeah. So this is so, happening. And, that was a, and, uh, and, you know, if you'll give me 20 seconds, uh, mm -hmm. when I, when we got shut down for COVID, mm -hmm. I flew back from the show I was doing in Vancouver and the um, executive was just checking in on me. She was like, Oh, did you make it back? Um, yeah. So we're probably going to be down for a while. Got anything you want to pitch? And the answer to that question is always yes. Oh, right? <laughs> and I had oh, yeah. the germ of an idea. And I was like, yeah, I've got this thing about this young black kid who gets into a martial arts team and blah, blah, blah. And she was like, great. Do you have a treatment? The answer is yes. Yeah. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, have a treatment. Just give me a couple days to uh, punch it up. And I was like, all right, now we got to write this thing. <laughs> and six great months job. later, you know, I'm pitching it successfully to the Disney company. So wow. all good. Awesome. Always say yes. Always. And then... Um, and people can find your work at marcusstokes.com. And um, were you directing before a pandemic? And like, can we find that work anywhere? Or like, where's uh, Yeah, I did, uh, I did several episodes of a Nickelodeon show called The Astronauts. Most recently, I finished uh, 911 Lone Star, which just aired last week. And I just did a 30 car pileup in an episode of 911, which will air in, uh, I think, early April. Nice. And from here, I go up to Vancouver and I'll be doing uh, the last couple of episodes of Flash this season. Oh, there we go. There we go. Yeah, just, you know, just Flash, you know? Yeah. <laughs> just um, a small little show. Just that thing. Just that, that, that thing. Um, Lisa, you have, you are actually one of the busiest people I know. Um, and <laughs> um, is there anything you want to talk about or plug? Because you've got a lot going on. Um, hey, I'm back at Tippet for a little while with, with Corey. Awesome. I'm teaching my classes that cause story matters. And, um, and I also work with, I'm working with some, you know, 
uh, individual screenwriters on their on their pieces. Mm -hmm. um, and I have my little company and I'm working on some projects there. But other than that, I'm, you know. There's all, okay, but I'm gonna plug this, is that you were newly elected at the beginning of the year um, as uh, Visual Effects Society Board of Directors Chair, which means you are like chair of the whole shebang, the whole world. And it and you are the first woman to ever hold that position. So there it is. Yeah. There it is. Thank you. There I'm we are. My Kamala moment. <laughs> 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 All right. All right. So I, I just want to say I'm so honored to be in a panel with these two brilliant guys. Mark, it's great to meet you. You just bring so much wisdom. And Corey, you're just, you know, you're Corey. What can yeah. I say? Yeah. Awesome. And David, we don't we can't forget the fact. You're a, a story expert yourself. You would just took a backseat to, to moderate. So, yeah. you know. It's not my show. Great, great little brain yeah. test right yeah. here. So, all right. Well, thank you everyone for, for attending, for watching, for coming. We are going to have this uh, recorded and we're going to do some polish. We're going to have lower thirds and all that stuff. It's going to be fantastic. Um, and then we will have more stuff coming up from the Bay Area very quickly. But thank you everyone for attending. And I believe that is it. And I'm going to hit the end button. Thank you and good night. Good night. Thank right, you. Good night.